Hi, my name is Pete. I'm with Wingman Studios. And today I'd like to talk about some deep dive thinking that I've done over really the past couple of years where I've challenged some of my belief systems when it comes to audio. I've challenged some of my belief systems when it comes to performing. I am a guitar player, I'm a bass player as well. So when it comes to my rig and the sound of my rig, the type of instrument obviously that I play, all of the details that play into the overall tone of the uh, music that I'm trying to create. Now this also will go into recording as well. And what I've noticed is that over the years, there has been different phrases or let's say statements that have been made that as I begin to test them, they really either A, they're not completely true or some are not true at all in my experience. <laughs> and so the point that I'd like to make today is these videos that are coming will be videos that we can discuss these things and that would be helpful to you. Because what I've noticed when I adopted these ideas, these beliefs, what ended up happening is it either cost me money, it wasted time, or it kept me stuck, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna be able to present these, um, what I'm going to call fallacies that I adopted. These are beliefs that I that I fold or wholeheartedly adopted over the years, and realized that okay, this is really slowing me down. And many times, what has to happen when it comes to these ideas, when you hear somebody make a statement about um, maybe a recording technique or using certain types of gear or uh, fill in the blank, the point is is can you actually get empirical evidence? to be able to test these things. And sometimes it takes time <laughs> to kind of walk through uh, those doors of either testing or trying to make A-B comparisons to really confirm, okay, is this true or not? And so the upcoming series, let's say, of videos that I'm gonna be doing will be based around audio quality and music fallacies, okay? and what this means is that we're talking about fidelity, we're talking about things that hold people back, things that don't allow them to move forward uh, based upon a belief system. And it has nothing to do with musical styles or any of that type of stuff. So first thing that I'd like to talk about is what is a fallacy? So the definition of fallacy revolves around mistaken belief or failure in reasoning from unsound arguments. So kind of sounds like people are just maybe making stuff up. I don't know. Or maybe what's happening is that maybe a person did have an experience, but what happened was is the association or the causation of whatever the problem that they're trying to resolve, maybe that association, that, or not causation, I should reverse that, association and correlation, that's the proper word, correlation might not actually be the reason why you're having the issue. And sometimes what we can do is we can actually associate things that have nothing to do with the original problem. And these will be some of the things that we discuss and work out. So one fallacy that I see a lot in recording, audio and music production, is the appeal to popular opinion and the appeal to ignorance. I'm not calling people ignorant. I'm saying ignorance is really a, a lack of knowledge. And if you think about the word ignorance, it's essentially the word ignore is in the word ignorance. So are we ignoring or are we maybe not um, savvy enough or are we not willing to put the extra energy or the time in to be able to you know, challenge some of these fallacies that we're talking about? It's taken me years and years and years to challenge these things and to come to a place of understanding. But So the appeal to popular opinion simply means it must be right because everyone is doing it. An appeal to ignorance simply means a person doesn't know what they don't know. This is also called Dunning-Kruger. I've heard that expression used in dietary and medical circles where the statement essentially means 
when a person doesn't when a person doesn't know what they don't know, right? This can be very dangerous, obviously, in medical community because you're going to have casualties of people's lives, right? When you might be, um, uh, let's say, practicing medicine when you don't know what you don't know. So that can be troublesome. So it's not as mission critical in audio, but the point, in other words, people aren't going to die in the process. But the point is, is that you could put people through pain uh, in the process and we don't want to do that. So in other words, a person says something must be true just because they don't know any evidence against the argument. And I've seen a lot of that. I've seen a lot of bandwagoning where people are just jumping on board or, again, they're bandwagoning based on convenience. And we'll discuss that more as we get into these. So this video is not to stir up argument, even though it might. And what I want to do as we get into these and as I go through each one of these um these uh, statements, and each statement will have its own video. As we go through each one of these, what I want us to see is that I want to steel man the argument or steel man maybe why this statement has become popular. And then in that regard, then what we can do is we can actually discuss it and talk about it because there could be truth in there when it comes to what the statement actually is saying, some truth. Yet at the same time, there could be elements that are there that can be misleading or leading us down a path, like I'd shared earlier, where it costs us time, money, and being stuck. And we want to go beyond that if we can. So this video is to help us think about what we are doing in music. Think about what we're doing in recording. Think about what we're doing in music production. I've got a lot of heroes, a lot of guys that I've, I've listened to their lectures and um, have been amazed at the wisdom that comes from uh, some of these legendary producers, legendary mix engineers, uh, not just mix engineers, but just engineers in general and audio. One of the guys who rises to the top for me is Bruce Woodin. And he said it clearly, it's all about the music. That statement right there is an aligning statement because what it does is it helps us to know the why of what we're doing, right? Why are we doing this? Well, the music needs to move us. It needs to impact us. It needs to move us emotionally. Somewhere in all of our lives, you're probably listening to this because you're a music lover and music in some ways impacted you somewhere, you know, in your past. So it touches us changes us, emotionally moves us. Maybe it was the song. Maybe it was the sound of the recording. Maybe it was like, man, I've, I've never heard chord changes quite like that before. That groove is amazing. The sound of this is just absolutely beautiful. The colors that blossom, you know, from the music. Bruce said he had synesthesia when he heard music and he saw colors and images. What's interesting is I, too, have that same thing. I have this weird miswiring in my brain. When I hear music, I see colors and I see gradients. I didn't realize it until Bruce had said something about it. And I'm like, now, wait a minute. I got that same thing, too. And what's interesting is that I, uh, I seem to gravitate around, let's say, jazz music. And that's not the only music that I, that I listen to or play. But I gravitate around jazz music and sometimes gospel music because they have all of these wonderful harmonies. And what it does is it sets my synesthesia on fire. <laughs> OK, I, I see colors and I'm, I'm very attracted to those styles because of what it does with the synesthesia. Music is capable of doing this. Um, it's it's capable of changing us emotionally. It impacts us. It seems to time stamp us in our lives. It's music can be the, uh, the soundtrack really of our life. You know, there's just through all of the years and the changes and the artists who have come and gone. This is the amazing thing about it. This includes the quality of the music, including how it was performed, uh, how it sounds. All of these make a difference, how it was captured and how it was put together and ultimately mixed. Now, the best way I can describe what's happening today at least in the music field, people that I've encountered, people that I work with, people that I've run into, uh, even music students that I've worked with, um, 
what I've noticed is that there is a lot of belief systems that, like myself, were holding us back. And some of these things need to be challenged. And it's not challenging in a way where, hey, we're going to argue about this. No, the challenge is, hey, let's take a look at this and let's see if this is true or not. And does it help if you maybe change the belief, change the approach, change the process so that you can get to a higher place ultimately? So we're going to discuss the fallacies that I ran into over the years. This is over many years. Uh, that I've that I've bought into and realized it was holding me back. And it was holding me back from experiencing something greater in my pursuits and growing in the art form that we call music. So audio has taken on attributes that reflect sometimes like politics and religion. Why don't we like to talk about those things? Because it seems like there's too many angles. There's not enough empirical evidence to prove one thing over another and therefore, it becomes very subjective. And at that juncture, it's very difficult to nail down maybe why something is the way that it is. And so, therefore, there can be a lot of association. There can be a lot of correlation going on rather than getting down to the true causation of why we're experiencing something that maybe can be resolved, fixed, made better, whatever the case might be. So the reason why fallacies come out of these subjects is because it's, it, like I said, it's very difficult to sit down and test these things. For me, it's taken years, you know, to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to start testing things and I'm going to see if some of these statements are true. So every one of these fallacies I'm going to share are challenges that, again, I've been through. All right. I'm not judging anybody. If I'm judging anybody, I'm judging myself for not getting hip <laughs> to challenging these ideas earlier on. So here are common statements that are made, many of which have uh, been said over the years. I've said them. I've repeated them, parroted them without empirical evidence or simply testing these things out myself. But now I have, and I'm going to share them with you to help you so that you don't end up falling into the same traps. And um, we're going to discuss these things one by one. So the goal here is to help us from getting stuck, again, like I did, poor thinking processes that kept me from moving forward to my musical goals. We call it stinking thinking. And uh, some of these things need to be aired out. So here's the list. And this list is in no particular order. I started riffing and writing things down, taking some notes so that I can stay on course here. So the first one is this. And again, in no particular order. The first fallacy that I came across in my thinking was this. Audio cables don't make a difference. We're going to discuss that. So that's going to be the... That's the first one on this list, but not necessarily the first video that'll be produced, but that will be one of them. The next one is there's no big difference in sample rates. Heard this countless times. Uh, record at 48 kilohertz because that's where everyone is at. Plus, people won't hear the difference on their cheap earbuds. Um, I think there we've got value systems that are kind of taking us. It's like a race to the bottom. And I think that can be challenged. And I believe that if you were to um, maybe challenge it yourself, you're going to find that your music uh, is going to get better. So we're going to talk about that. High and low frequencies, the next one, high and low frequencies do not make a difference and should be rolled off. Uh, I've heard that quite a bit. And I believe that there's, uh, there's some truth to this one. And we need to challenge some of the other things when it comes to this particular topic. Let's go to the next idea, uh, the next statement. All digital audio converters are the same and don't make a difference. Um, I've seen some shootouts online where what I've noticed is that the way that they're doing the shootout is where the problem is, which means that you're making a correlation association that's not accurate to why your audio sounds the way that it does and I see the same fallacy in software. Not all software is the same. Not all software renders the audio the same. And so it's going to be important to, uh, to look at that video when we get there. Let's look at the next fallacy. Plugins are the same or better than their analog counterparts. Plugins, monitor DSP. This is a big one. 
and modelers. Okay, in other words, modelers meaning you know amp modelers, uh, guitar amp modelers, bass modelers, these types of things are the same or better than the real thing. Um, what I've noticed in this area, I don't, I'm not going to jump into this deeply right now because it's just one of the topics. But what I'm seeing is this concept of convenience over quality. That seems to be what's driving that, but we'll discuss this more. The next one is compression is the catalyst to great mixes. Compress all instruments on the way in and on the way out. Um, we're going to challenge that. Uh, Bruce Swedeen challenged that, and uh, he was never caught up in the idea of compression. I don't want to give it away. We're going to discuss this in the future. We should all be striving for our music to be under the moniker of being modern. That will be one of the topics that we talk about. Um, it's funny that there's buzzwords. I mean, I'm, what I'm hearing a lot of is this. I'm hearing the word modern all the time. So if it's not modern, then what is it, right? So it's cheap, junk, dated, not good. You know, what are we saying? The other is vibe. You know, these are like really unmeasurable words, right? That there's no way to, to put your fingers on it. What's going on? Why does it sound the way that it sounds? Vibe is one of those words. Um, I'm sure that there are many more, but uh, we're going to dive into that too, so that we might have a little bit more, um, whether it's empirical evidence or just being able to A-B things and, and come to a conclusion of what might be better in the process of using certain pieces of equipment. Let's go to the next one. We should all be striving for our music to be under the moniker of being modern. I already said that because <laughs> I'm reading my notes. Let's go to the next one. Analog gear is a waste of money. That's the next one. Uh, I bought into that early on and uh, quickly realized that that's the furthest from the truth, but we're gonna discuss that. How about the next one? Mix bus processing is the first analog gear you should buy. I've heard that by quite a few people and I believe that there are probably better first purchases and we're gonna discuss that as we go. The next one, there is no difference between digital audio converters. This kind of goes back to um, sample rate, it goes back to, um, you know, that converters don't make a difference. Um, they do make a difference and we will discuss that in detail. Let's go to the next statement that I, of course, fell for. And this is, you must have mix bus processing to make your mixes sound commercial or professional. And I'll even add the word modern. I'll even add the word have the right vibe. OK, um, we need to talk about this one and uh, that will be, of course, one of the videos. Next is you can mix with any type of speaker as a studio monitor. All right. We're going to kind of discuss that. I think there's there's some truth to to this one. At the same time, there's going to be a lot of pain and wasted time in the process. So I believe we can help with that as we talk about that subject. The next one is analog mixing consoles are retro dated, old school, and are not necessary. Well, as you can see, I've got one back here and I got racks and racks of gear over here. So you can, as you can tell, you can notice that, all right, I didn't, I'm not buying into that now. Um, but we will discuss some of the nuances about mixing consoles, their benefit. And uh, there's a lot of talk online, you know, or at least, you know, on the internet, YouTube about these things. Hopefully that we can bring a, maybe a fresh perspective to some of this. Some of it might be regurgitated, but I think some of it will be fresh. Let's go to the next one. We use analog tape for vibe. Well, there's the word vibe again. Uh, distortion is vibe, right? You got to saturate. Everything's got to be saturated. You got to saturate. Let's discuss that. And we'll uh, begin to realize that maybe that isn't the best way to uh, make things happen. Let's go to the next uh, phrase here. There is no difference between audio file formats. This is kind of an interesting one that I've been diving into lately more and more. And what I'm realizing is there is a difference. And so we need to be able to talk about that and understand what we're getting into whenever we choose the, the final, um, you know, let's say recording 
platform or the ability to archive our music, what that final resting place is going to be as we do that. Um, let's take a look at the next one. Convenience is more important than sound quality in music playing and in production. All right. I kind of talked about that a little bit about plugins and the DSP and all of this kind of stuff, but this is a big one. And this is in many ways is what's fueling, um, again, the race to the bottom when it comes to quality. And, uh, I always go back to this statement, you know, again, why are we doing music? Well, music touched you in some way. And it was the sound, it was the quality of the sound, it was the song, the quality of the song. It was these things that really, really uh, impacted each of us. And there was a reason why it did. And many times it was because there was attention to some detail. And sometimes the details that we're paying attention to are not the things that make the difference when it comes to the total impact of the song. And we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more as well. Um, this is an interesting one. We can add as many plugins or pieces of gear to our signal chains without negative effects on the audio signal. That's one that I thought was absolutely true and realized uh, maybe less is more. We're going to discuss it. Let's go to the next one. There are no phase issues when processing or adjusting a single instrument. That's an interesting concept when we realize that actually one single instrument is actually made up of more than one wave of sound, that the generation of that instrument actually has multiple waves in it, including harmonic overtones. This changes everything when you understand how EQ affects that, how compression and other effects will change and alter that sound and possibly make it less impactful, um, maybe less high fidelity in the process of messing around with it. The next uh, statement was, because a manufacturer says a product performs a task also means that the task performed is done well. All right, we're going to, we're going to discuss that one. My, uh, real quick, a quick illustration of this would be, let's say if you, if you saw somebody, let's say that you were very attracted to that individual, right? But you never heard them speak. You, 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 you've never heard them communicate. Then all of a sudden, at some juncture, you have an opportunity to hear them talk. And from the first couple of words out of their mouth, you realize, okay, I was attracted to them physically, but I'm, I, you know, the attraction basically stops <laughs> right here based upon what I heard. Okay. That's kind of what happens with equipment. And people say, oh, no, no, you know, it, it says it does this in the equipment. You know, it looks like it, it, it's got a lot of lights on it. You know, it looks cool. Therefore, it must be great. It must sound great. Well, we're going to discuss that and uh, look into those a little bit deeper. The uh, next point is there is no audio that's better than other audio. It's just different. I hear this and I know why people share this is because they don't want to offend anybody. And I get it. We don't want to offend. But I do believe that there are benchmarks of quality. And we should, as engineers, music producers, music players, we should, you know, at least thrive, strive for that. And if you don't have a delineating point of what's good and bad, then we don't know what's going on. So, in other words, my wife said it this way. She get, she said that I guess all audio gets a trophy, right? <laughs> we live in an age where everybody gets a trophy, even if you don't even show up. So the idea is, is that there needs to be a point where we realize, okay, there are better ways of doing things and then there's ways that aren't necessarily as good. And again, that's what these talks will be about. And it's not to dog anybody and it's not to criticize. It's just to be able to talk about it, unpack it. Again, steel man, maybe the statement and see why people might think that and then move forward uh, maybe with a better way of thinking that's going to move us forward. Um, and again, this point about um, audio, there's no audio better than the other. This has nothing to do with music style at all. Let's go to the next one. Mistakes based on ignorance in music production should be made into industry standard processes. 
And I've seen this where people, they, again, they adopt some of these belief systems, thinking processes that are not the best, and they utilize that. And then the next thing you know, this becomes the way they do everything. And now that becomes the standard. This subpar way of doing things becomes the standard. And I believe that that needs to be talked about. And I, I've got some stuff to, to share when it comes to that. Let's go to the next one. Um, low-end equipment sounds just as good as industry standard high-end equipment. It depends on who's using it. I've heard that many times, and I also believe that. We all have to start somewhere when it comes to our musical journey, when it comes to purchasing equipment, whether it's for live performance or if we want to get into recording and producing and these types of things. you got to start somewhere. And all of us, I'm sure, are on limited budgets when it comes to these types of things. So you have to plan and you have to make the best decisions you can. This is another reason why I'm doing these, is to help you to make good decisions rather than, um, you know, there's a term out there called buy once, cry once. What does that mean? That means if you buy something that is subpar because you didn't know better, you probably lost money in that transaction because you will be buying something in the future and you probably won't be able to offload that for the equal amount you paid for it, which means that, or offload it at all, because there might be people that don't want it. So the point is, is that you, uh, can make better decisions that will move you forward faster. And this is another one of those points. Let's go to the next one. Ones and zeros always sound better than electrons through copper. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, am I talking about analog versus digital? Well, you're just going to have to watch that video to find out. Of course, that is a can, that is a highly contested idea between those two concepts. And uh, I do believe that there's wisdom on both sides and we need to figure out what's going to be best for especially those of us who don't have um, unlimited budgets. How do we move forward with confidence to know what we should get, what we should do? How, would, how do we move forward? What's going to sound the best, especially at our tier of working? Let's take a look at the next one. Professional recordings are done with a click track on the grid. We're going to discuss that one. There have been other people who've talked about these things. Uh, but I want to bring some other nuances in on it that I think will um, help challenge some of that. Grid is great for certain things, but like I said, uh, we will steel man the, um, that, uh, that comment. We will steel man that point. And then what we'll do is we'll begin to unpack things around it to see if there's a better way of handling it. So every butt cut or punch when we record needs a crossfade. So this is going to be talking about all of the preparatory work and cleaning up tracks and this type of thing and how necessary is all of these things. I believe at certain times, right? Well, again, we'll steel man that one and then we'll, we'll kind of unpack, uh, some other ways of looking at it. Okay. So the next is, this is an interesting one. This one is audio files keep audio snake oil salesmen in business. And I used to say that, I used to think that, and now I don't at all. Uh, audiophiles are interesting people because they are very focused on the detail of the music and how, how great it sounds and how it impacts you. Um, so the point is, is we're going to unpack that one as well. Uh, here's one. Phase issues are fixed by lining up audio files in your DAW, your DAW, your digital audio workstation. This is how the pros do it. All right. Well, we're going to discuss that and we're going to take a look and see, is that true or is that not true? And why is there empirical evidence uh, to the contrary? Let's discuss the next one here just to, for a little bit. Automation is the only way to mix like a pro. That's the next point. I've heard that many, many times, and I've got different viewpoints on that as well. Can it be helpful? Sure. But I believe that there could be other ways that are better uh, to uh, get a great mix and to um, get everything in its place. Um, and we're going to talk about why sometimes automation, many times automation, uh, 
put you in a compromised spot. And uh, we'll talk about that one as well. So that's the list. Every one of these statements held me back in some capacity, all right? So this isn't me just trying to lash out or dog the industry or to, you know, criticize people. What this is, is what I realized is because of the fact that hook, line, and sinker, I essentially adopted these beliefs, I was held back in some capacity. And the more clear we can be about our thinking and our processes and working with evidence that actually works. We're not dealing with, again, correlations. We're not dealing with associations that just chase a bunch of rabbits that sort of keep the um, the audio quality water cloudy. What this will do, this will help to bring clarity and allow really for all of us to discuss. This could also you know, allow for people to add comments and things like that. I always try to do the best I can to reach out to everybody who makes a comment. And because uh, I, I value all of you and I, I value everyone who has subscribed. I value all of you who have liked what we've done so far. And we're going to continue moving forward. And I think uh, through the process of this, I think all of us are going to have a great time. Uh, the reason why we're doing this is because it is a lot of fun. And uh, I want your experience to be the best it can be. So again, my name is Pete, Wingman Studios. Until next time.